my parents had a great influence on getting me and also my sister interested in all things outdoors. We used to go walking in the Alps quite a lot. I'm from Austria, so that was sort of standard weekend uh, to-do list was go up a mountain, eat some homemade uh, sandwiches, walk back down, and on the way collect all sorts uh, from mushrooms to rocks, um, much to the detriment of my parents who had to uh, carry down the rock collections. Um, so we spent a lot of time outdoors and I was really just fascinated by everything. Like, uh, I think I was just super interested in anything that had a system, in anything where I could spot some form of a, of a structure or, you know, some, some relationship between different things. My love of categorizing definitely took some um, very uh, peculiar levels, like the best present you could get me, I think from the age of five or six, was a new box because that meant I could make a new subcategory of my Lego bricks, whether that was by color or type. And I, I think still somewhere in my parents' attic, there's a collection of probably a hundred different boxes of all shapes and sizes. When I was in uh, primary school, um, we used to stay in sort of an after school club until the evening, because both my parents were working full time. And one of the ladies, uh, Frau Freitag, who used to look after us, she was very kind and at some point gifted me this sort of ancient tiny microscope made out of brass. I think it was meant to be more of a decorative object than a scientific one, but I took it home and uh, tried to stick everything I could find uh, from dead bugs and bits of my mom's vegetable garden under the microscope to figure out what it looked like. I have some very strong memories of doing that and just hoping that some fly would die somewhere in the house so I could stick it under the microscope. I think what I really liked about chemistry already in school was that from the beginning there was a system, right? You start with the periodic table of the elements and intrinsically already there's a system. Someone has come up with ordering the elements in a way that is highly logical and that appealed to me. And then going step by step, you know, thinking about crystal structures or how reactions take place, there are rules and, and systems that govern all of that and that appealed to me uh, greatly. When I started, I thought I would do biochemistry. Um, I did my first lab, I hated the smell of the growth media and decided I needed a complete change. So that's when I sort of moved over to inorganic chemistry and in particular surfaces and interfaces. That really fascinated me, like the complexity of what happens when you put two materials together rather than look at them in isolation. Or when you look at the differences between the bulk of the material and the surface. I just thought that was a really interesting part of chemistry to study. So during my undergrad, um, I needed some extra money <laughs> to fund being a student. So I started as an intern at a big semiconductor company, sort of working Fridays and working um, during the holidays. And that really gave me a good introduction to what industrial research is like, um, really gave me an appreciation of the challenges you face when you use materials for an actual everyday application. And to also work in an environment full of not just chemists like myself, but engineers and physicists and material scientists who all come together to solve specific problems. I knew I wanted to up my understanding of fundamental solid state inorganic chemistry a bit more because I felt that that was so important in semiconductor industry, but that there weren't enough chemists doing that. So I looked for a PhD project in solid state and inorganic chemistry. And uh, that's where I came across my soon to be PhD supervisor's work, Russ Ekdel, who, who worked a lot in solid state chemistry and understanding semiconductors and um, metal oxides with very specific electronic properties. I did my first synchrotron experiment quite early on in my PhD, I think it was 2010, 2011. And I went with my PhD supervisor, Ras Ekdal, and we were joined by uh, Roger Cowley. And Roger and Russ, one being a physicist, one being a chemist, had these intense discussions about X-ray diffraction and truncation rods. And we were at XMAS, um, a diffraction beamline at the European Synchrotron, the ESRF, and I just remember feeling absolutely out of my depth. 
I was just, you know, just watching these two greats of uh, solid state physics and chemistry discussing something that was so complex and complicated that I really struggled to wrap my head around. But I think it was also one of the most intense learning experience. Like uh, during those few days that we had together, I learned a lot, not just about the science itself, but also about how physicists and chemists can talk to each other, <laughs> even if it's challenging. And I think what I found very uh, sort of rewarding during, during the experiment was that I still felt I was contributing. Basically, I tried to just analyze the data on the fly, make plots, and then Russ and, and Roger would just, you know, sort of uh, scratch their heads and discuss over it. But I, I felt I was still part of the discussion. They made me really part of the team, although I was a very inexperienced PhD student at the time. One of the most rewarding things now is that I can take students myself and hopefully give them also this positive initial experience when they go to the synchrotron for the first time. I think it's also, I'm sort of reliving the excitement and the awe that you have when you first walk into a synchrotron facility, at least I do, because I still feel it's such an impressive environment and it's such a big feat of, you know, a huge group of people to put these machines together. Because, you know, it's, it's a lot of effort. It's a lot of people who are dedicating their time, their experience to it. It's a huge cost, right? I definitely feel a bit of, of pressure and, and often a touch of anxiety just before <laughs> to make sure that what we do um, has the best chance of succeeding. Every time I go to the synchrotron now to do an experiment, no matter how often I've been to that specific uh, synchrotron, I will at least once walk around the ring without a phone, just taking it in. And I feel like it's a nice reminder just to let it sink in the sort of privilege that I still feel to be able to go to these uh, facilities, to use them to test some of my science ideas, right? And to work in an environment that is, I, I think, still incredibly inspiring and exciting. Now my group works a lot on interfaces, right? The contact areas between different materials with different characteristics. When you work in solid state chemistry, you're also very, very close to solid state physics. The two of them are just traditionally separate, but I think in essence, they are the same. You might use slightly different language or a slightly different approach to the same material, the same problem, the same characteristic you're describing but they're really close. So I presume you could say that I, I always work on the boundaries, whether it's in different fields or also between materials. One of the biggest themes of research in the group is on electronic materials. And that's quite a wide range of materials, but in essence, those are materials, and in our case, solids, that have some property that makes them particularly good in electronic applications. So for example, for electronic devices that you might use in a mobile phone, a laptop, an electric car, etc. So we are really looking fundamentally at the properties and characteristics of solids, of solid materials, but with the aim to find either new materials for new devices or improve already existing device concepts by using different ways of increasing a certain performance or certain characteristic in the material. At the moment, still, most electronic devices that we use in our everyday life are based on silicon. And silicon has been almost over-optimized over the last few decades and has really enabled this revolution that, you know, everything around us from the internet, computers, connectivity, you know, has caused. But we are really, we've eked out as much as we can from silicon. There's really nothing left. The, the, the material has given us everything it can. So what we are now trying to do is to find the next generation of materials that, at least in certain aspects, can outperform silicon and can enable us to generate the next sort of level of devices
in the area of semiconductors, one thing that we currently are really interested in are ultra wide band gap semiconductors. So semiconductors where there is a big difference in energy between the valence electrons and the conduction electrons. What they can do for us is that they can handle much higher power loads. And why do we care? Well, we need those materials because in applications such as electric cars, we need to have devices that are able to handle the electric loads that a car produces. That really is important to make more efficient electric cars, make electric cars that can output more power when needed and can also handle much higher, for example, frequencies of reaction. So these ultra wide band gap materials are not silicon. Silicon has a band gap of about 1.1 electron volt, which is very narrow, whilst these ultra wide band gap materials, we're talking four or five times that in terms of the band gap. So they are very distinctly different and most ultra wide band gap materials are compounds. So for example, silicon carbide, gallium nitride, gallium oxide. So there's a lot more chemistry that comes into play. One of the main advantages of ultra wide band gap materials is that they are more tolerant to a lot of power being put through them. So a normal device, if you put too much power load on it, will fail. You will have a short circuit in the simplest word, and it will just no longer behave like a switch, for example, that you need to switch a current back and forth in a car. These ultra wide band gap materials are happy to take a lot of power. They are also happy to be in a hot environment. They can tolerate much higher temperatures. If you think about the environment you might have around the engine of a car, there's usually some temperature load. But beyond sort of electric car applications, what's really important is these ultra wide band gap materials and devices are really essential for sort of the connected grid, the intelligent electricity grid. So we also need those in wind turbines, in photovoltaics. So they really play a part across the sort of whole idea of a green economy going forward. I think the main technique that we use in the research group to look at the electronic structure of materials is something called X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. It's a technique where we shine X-rays onto a sample, we excite electrons, the so-called photoelectrons from the material, and the energy that those electrons have tells us a lot about what elements are present, what their chemical environment is, but most importantly, what the electronic structure of the material is. And at Diamond, there's one beamline in particular, beamline IO9, that we go to really frequently because it provides us with one of the world's best beamlines to do that technique. So it combines soft and hard X-rays, so X-rays with very different energies that we can shine onto the same spot of a sample. And what this difference in energy does, it gives us an information about the surface and the bulk of a material. And that's really important for us because we care about surfaces and interfaces. What that means in the device concept is if I have a device with lots of different layers, by tuning the energy, I can sort of tune through the stack and really focus on a bird layer or a bird interface and get chemical and electronic structure information from that part of the device structure. Outside of, of science and, and going to synchrotrons, um, I definitely need something that is not indoors and behind a heavily lead clad doors. So I love being in the garden. Um, I've loved gardening. I think my mom, my, my grandma all were very um, enthusiastic gardeners and um, I'm trying to live up to their standards. But I still take a lot of comfort again from systems. So being outdoors still gives me a huge level of comfort but then I also have a notebook where I write down what worked, what didn't work, what did I plant where. I keep all of my labels of plants you know in, in meticulous little boxes and things because even outside of science these systems give me great pleasure and kind of um, just relax me. <laughs>